Our guest here today is Peter Xu. Uh, in the West, we would call him a social media influencer. In China, they call him uh, a key opinion leader. But either or, he has 8 million followers plus uh, on Weibo and is present across many other platforms. Weibo, by the way, for those who don't know, uh, is a micro-blogging platform that's kind of the Chinese equivalent to Twitter with more functions and more capabilities. Peter Xu, welcome. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Hello. How are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, it's so good to be here. <laughs> So Peter, there's a slide up there that shows roughly who you are and gives a couple of, of, uh, of indications, uh, but there is much more to, 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 to you. And I will start by just explaining who you are and what you do. The easiest label is the one that the New York Times used recently. They called you the top social media influencer in China. Congratulations, not a bad title to, to have. But you started out doing other things. You started out doing some music and then teaching English, and in China, good English teachers become celebrities, uh, contrary <laughs> yeah. to what happens. Like Jack Ma, right? Uh, like Jack Ma, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then you did some television, you did a reality show. Yes. Uh, tell us about your beginnings, uh, just so that we can know a little bit about you before we talk about your activity as influencer. I mean, way back, it's like... Uh 2009, I basically, I, I worked in L'Oreal before as a marketeer. I did marketing for skincare and makeup products in the beginning, uh, product marketing, branding. And then uh, I realized uh, I'm curious to the world of fashion. It's not just about the face, from, from the face and then to the whole body. So uh, I start working with, uh, in the beginning, streetwear brands, younger generation, of course. And then I work with Dior. Uh, I worked with Bordeaux wine. I started to expand like uh, the field that I work with, the brand that I uh, talk to. And because at the time I was teaching, I have big classes. Like in China, sometimes I teach towards 1,000 members, yeah. like a uh, you know, an big teacher. class. Yeah. Yes. And then we help them to go overseas. They need to take TOEFL to the USA, or they need to take IELTS to the, the UK and Australia, for example. So those are initially my audience, and then they start to follow me on my blog. And then because I do TV, and in China, the big celebrities always need to do TV or movies. Uh, it doesn't, it's not enough to, to just be social media active. Uh, all the supermodels that you know, like Liu Wen, or like Ming Shi, some of the Victoria's Secret Angels you saw now today on TV, uh, I mean on big screen TV globally, they usually made it big first in China by go on TV shows. So for example, I, you know, sometimes I go to second, third tier city to do like speech or public presentation. Uh, there are like people recognizing me on the street. They tell me they recognize me from TV first. So social media in China I think is important, but usually like when we do social media, we talk about first and second tier city. Yeah. mostly. Now, of course, third too. But then people in China, because China is so big, so many cities, especially tier three and tier four, they're still, you know, very uh, tied to traditional media, like yeah. newspaper, like television, especially kids and relatively older people. Now yeah. still, they watch TV. They yeah. uh, go on these major platforms. They read newspaper. So one so. reinforces the other in terms of your presence and, and, uh, and uh, celebrity. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then you moved oh. into, into full-time mm -hmm. uh, blogging. Of course, yeah. building up followership, you know, 500 or 1,000 at a time through your classes is not a bad way of starting. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, how did you start into, you know, when did you make the step to go full-time into blogging? I think it's just very gradually I get busier from the blogging side, also working with brands, and then I figure out, okay, I have a bigger platform to express myself and to, to help more people. Because online, literally, I'm exposed to not just my followers, but the general public, anybody, they probably see my name. Like, uh, uh, you know, I feel like class is really relatively smaller, even, you know, TV shows. So... Uh, I think it's like in, in Paris, 2012, yeah. I start to do uh, fashion weeks. At that time, I haven't stepped into watch uh, Basel World. I think it's like 2014, I've been to, or 15, I went to Basel World, much later stage. So uh, yeah, I think 2012, that was uh, like a golden time when and Weibo and these social media platforms in China start to explode, yes. And at the beginning, mm -hmm. you 
mm -hmm. went like many other bloggers and microbloggers in the direction yeah. of great photos and great selfies, possibly with some photoshopping in the in the middle. That's what you, you did at the beginning. I right? didn't retouch my photos at all, actually, in the okay. very beginning. <laughs> but you know, in China, it's like uh, we say, especially the younger generation, uh, they're so into visual elements. Now, if you look at brands, for example, you know, you ask younger generation, I think no matter in China or here in Switzerland or in New York or in Paris, young people, they love Supreme. They love Off-White. They think it's a religion. So it's some kind of a signage or symbol, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, like that. Okay. So, I, I mean, uh, that was uh, basically difference between my generation and probably your audience of uh, this generation. For yeah. example, in the morning, I'm still talking about SIHH, for example. SIHH, for younger generation to memorize, it could be a sign. It could be like a, a symbol or an emblem. It's how they memorize or react to things. Uh, more visual, less like sophistication of, you know, words. Uh, when it comes back to the pictures, they're really into taking selfies or, you know, like sharing their lifestyle in their private social media in their moment. In China, we have WeChat, and then they share the content in their moment, which is basically photo or visual oriented. So they're really into this retouching. Mm -hmm. But I think also now we encourage them, on the other side, like social media encourages people to be real to themselves. So I think there is a certain degree, a certain level of, uh, of this Photoshopping cannot be over retouched. It still has to be, you know, sometimes you see certain celebrities that don't really look like this person in, in reality. Yeah. So, so I think that's way too far. I've actually seen yeah. a couple of interviews of you yeah. recently where you said, uh, I'm actually tired of all these faking pictures and, 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 and Photoshopping pictures. Mm -hmm. I want more authenticity. Uh, yes. And they try to stick to, to that. Yeah. Uh, what do you tell, so, Moving forward from your beginnings as blogger and microblogger to today, mm -hmm. uh, what do you tell your followers, fans, and readers today? What kind of, of topics and subjects you approach and how? I mean, now we are kind of a studio, a platform, so it's all about fashion, lifestyle, uh, in general, what people are curious about. Now, fashion weeks, for example, now Paris Fashion Week, Milan Fashion Week is going on. Young people really care about that. And there are so many celebrities going. And now, SIHH definitely is also trending. Social media topics, uh, I think partially thanks to the, uh, the new look of SIHH, it's become, it's, it's, the topic is really relevant now about colors of time, and you see big mega celebrities going to Piaget yesterday, and also to AP, uh, you know, so if you search Geneva now in Chinese Twitter now, if you type in Geneva, uh, because there will be auto reminding of trending keywords, it will pop up like watch fair or Geneva celebrities names, you know, it's very relevant now. So I talk about watch, I talk about menswear, women's wear. My team, we do Victoria's Secret, we do Cannes. And in China, there are fashion weeks, Shanghai and Beijing, and like Shenzhen, some other second tier city, we cover that. We also do uh, certain street style, street style like young people, what they wear. Uh, we talk about uh, design language with designers. We help certain designers to grow their business mm -hmm. and to work with celebrities. So basically, okay. it's a spectrum. Uh, I think it's more a little bit similar, maybe to Vogue Runway, but more you know social media alike. If you have Vogue Runway app or WWD, but more you know uh, social media like with me and my team, we uh, we cover the key events and we do video, we do photo, we do reports. Okay. Yes. So you have been here since mm -hmm. Saturday, I think, or Sunday. Yeah. Uh, so three days of SIHH. Tell, give us one example of something from SIHH that you have posted and told your fans back home? Uh, actually, there are a couple of things. I'm sorry, there are too many things, actually. I was so uh, blown away, uh, overwhelmed. The opening day, I was so impressed by the 3D interaction between the dancer you know, and the projection. Uh, the colors on site, it was really impressive. I didn't know SIHH could be this colorful. I mean, it could be colorful, but mm -hmm. to that level, I'm 
blown away. Um, and there was uh, Pierce Brosnan just in front of us for the opening night, and everybody was like, maybe it's a Swiss way, but I tell you, if in China, I mean, these celebrities showing up, there would be thousands of people screaming. But here, like, people, I, I think they're screaming inside, you know, but we're still busy posting, and people really like that. Uh, and the second day, I mean, we saw some Chinese celebrities, of course, uh, they're really big. Uh, tens of thousands of retweets generated on my social media. Um, at least, I think, 20,000 likes uh, so far for some certain celebrities and posts. And yesterday, Hugh Jackman is also he. Yeah. I'm so proud now. <laughs> he was here. He's the same chair. He's <laughs> yeah. the same chair. Wow, I should take it back as a souvenir. <laughs> and then, um, uh, you know, I enjoyed uh, what Roger Dubuis did with yeah. a Lamborghini car. Yeah. Because uh, it's just my personal sharing. Three years ago, I went to visit the manufacturer of Roger Dubuis. At that time, I felt a little distant from that brand because uh, it was talking about swords, warrior, you know, Excalibur, you know, that kind of a story. And then I feel like it was something my grandfather or my dad probably would, you know, be interested in. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then today I came over, like yesterday I came here, I saw the Lamborghini car and everything was like newer and better and different and within such a short time frame i mean for a watch brand that was that was definitely state of the art i think you know when i post that people really like like the color the vibe everything it was so crowded i mean i went to hojo dubuis the the area and it's you, you see the popularity in there now yes uh you've also created you mentioned before your mm -hmm. own production studio for yes. those videos you collaborate with magazines, with companies. Mm -hmm. uh, when you professionalize to that point, your activity on social media, how do you keep authenticity? How do you keep being yourself rather than going to being the marketing of yourself? Actually, it's not easy because uh, all of a sudden there are so many brands coming to you. But I think eventually we figure out that we need to differentiate between a service provider or studio and also an individual. I mean, as an individual, way back when I was doing, like, early on ages, when I was just doing my blogging career, I was, like, very, you know, just me, myself oriented. Like, what I like, what I don't like. Things I talk about are definitely things that I really gravitate to. Otherwise, <laughs> well, wow. sorry, sorry it's that. like the PPT. Like, some of the cases that we did maybe uh, in China. Uh, you know, like... That time, you know, I could say no to certain brands, not because I, uh, they don't have a budget or they don't want to, uh, you know, certain brands they want to expand in China. Maybe at that time, I don't have the resource or the know-how to help them. So I just say no, because I, I can't help you. I don't like you. Or, you know, this is uh, not the style that I have. You can only carry certain brands. You can only work with certain brands. And certain brands, you know, you cannot work with because they're like competitors, you know, mm -hmm. that kind yep. of, uh, of uh, you know. And then... Uh, when I start the studio, I feel like we can do a lot more. And uh, fashion sometimes to the general public of China is very superficial somehow. People only know brands. In the past, my previous generation, my parents' generation, they just buy brands. Like Louis Vuitton, they buy it, Bougarie, Cartier. They think it's a symbol of status. Now, uh, for this many visitations and presence in Europe, I've been to Europe for more than 50 or 60 times now, I think, uh, in the past uh, couple of years. I know, especially for watch brands and couture, or couture in Paris, uh, it's like I saw so many people working in the industry till the age of Karl Lagerfeld, like to the age of 70 or 80. In China, there is no such people. Like the, the fashion and also, I mean, even the generation of watchmakers and lovers in China, they're there in the industry for maybe 10, 20 years only. So we don't have like people with that so many years of Métier. And there are so many stories to tell behind, the behind the scenes, the, you know, the know-how, the métier. I feel like young people also, they need to be educated in that field. Because I used to teach language, I think in terms of uh, visual elements or these brand stories, they're also like language. You need like even more music, uh, culture, visual, all these elements that need to be properly exposed to these brands to know how to appreciate it. You buy no. brands not because it's, it's famous or prestigious. You buy it because you like it from the bottom of your heart. No, but yes. that's, that's also, mm -hmm. we had a discussion uh, the other day, and yeah. you told me there is a fascination in China for mm -hmm. not only the skills, but the tradition mm -hmm. of uh, the, the story of European brands. Yeah. Now it's different. Like, now, like, consumers are more mature, especially younger generation. I think Chinese people, especially Generation Z, younger generation, I think they're 
a lot similar to American counterparts now. Basically, these two countries, if you look at the market, if you look at like brand preferences, uh, I mean, when it comes to fashion, maybe Shanghai and Beijing are a lot similar to New York. It's like young people on the streets, streetwear, the brands they prefer, the consumer behavior. Uh, you know, not like in the past, China is China, very, you know, different from the other part of the world, like gates are closed. Now it's like uh, somehow more homogenous in that way. Mm -hmm. So I think language could be similar, the way of communication too. No, uh -huh. I know what's going to happen when I click this. Maybe the music will start Sorry. again, so let's see. Yeah. Yes, it's, it is. It's like a TikTok app in China for young kids. Exactly. They do all these interactions. Uh, so it's fun stuff, basically. And it's vertical screen. It's not So this is some training. of the stuff you're doing right now. Yeah, we do fashion show reports. We, we shoot these kind of uh, video and we release it like the next day after the event or on, on that night. Uh, of that event. Yeah. And Chaumet actually they did this and J12 uh, Chanel did it, Mont Blanc did one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also surprised because this platform is basically for generation uh, Y or Z. Uh, it's like Musical.ly. This company actually they own Musical.ly. Maybe you know Musical.ly, it's like Instagram story. Yep. And then uh, you have all the filters and fun elements in it. And then like my mom and my, my parents generation that I think nobody really you know, they're on it. But young people every day, they're on this, doing all these interactions. Uh, they're either doing live streaming or stories or they're just watching other people. You know, like very, one of the most trending uh, besides Weibo and WeChat. This is a... Uh, talking, yeah. about, talking about different platforms. Yeah. So yes. these logos here are not random. Uh -huh. These are almost all the companies and platforms you use. Yeah. Uh, so Weibo is your kind of main channel. Yeah. But you actually use like 25 or 30 of them. So yeah. tell me what is the thinking behind, what is the strategy? Is okay. it about yes. disseminating the content wherever people are? Yeah. Uh, what, what's the approach here? Uh, in China, I don't know if you know the strategy. Now it's very popular to say MCN. It's called multiple channel network distribution. It's like you have some good content and you distribute it not just on one platform. I think it's a SIHH official media partner. You can see it's a Chinese company called Han Tang. They're also doing that. They're distributing their video content, for example, of SIHH to all the TV stations in China. TV stations that are in need for luxury or watch information uh, if it's on target. So it's maybe 30 to 50. They're more into that TV category. I'm all like online, but you know, online people read different apps. Like for example, here, I think so. I think it's the same. Like people, you have Facebook, you have YouTube, you have all these platforms. In the past, I mean, when I was a blogger, usually we just do like, for example, Chinese Twitter, Weibo, or maybe WeChat. But then, because in China, the country is so big, it's so segmented, it's so fragmented somehow. So there, are, you know, sometimes you, 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 if you want to reach out to people who are interested in music, you have music platforms. And if you have, want, want to reach out to people who are more intellectual, they have uh, platforms like RSS feeds or, you know, like podcasts. There are so many. So, I mean, there are companies working on the distribution of content to put it to different platforms. And uh, so you are more exposed to a various, uh, a more diverse group of audience than just maybe a certain target. Um, and because in China, you know, I can never say I'm the top influencer, you know, like one day in fashion, one day you're in, the next day you're out. And in social media, we say social media and internet in China, one year equals to eight. So maybe like, Sometimes some platforms, some people are, are, are really trending or relevant, and the next day it could be something else. So we have to be, you know, as uh, connected as possible. So these platforms, you know, it could be 2080. You know, sometimes like Weibo and WeChat or Musically, I mean, the TikTok I show you, they probably they own like 80 percent of the total internet users, they capture them, but there is another 20%. And these 20%, sometimes they could be more relevant to a certain niche group of people, like watch lovers. Maybe sometimes, you know, my parent generation, they're still buying watches, they're still consumers of Mont Blanc, Parmigiani, but they said they don't want to be on Musical.ly or Chinese TikTok. They want to be on certain more, you know, in-depth platforms. So this is what we do is like with a company, some certain video, like we have to talk to different groups of people in their language. So for the younger generation, we do like the fun way. For the more, more mature generation, we probably have more in-depth 
uh, you, thorough you conversations. You told me you would write 10,000 words articles. Yeah, for, for this event, for SIHH, we definitely need to do a very thorough one. You know, like we need to do, like, for example, each booth, we have photos of the booth. We uh, shoot their key items, products. Uh, we also do video, and sometimes we have to have two types of video. One is horizontal for the more uh, computer, you know, laptop users, uh, desktops. And then we do uh, vertical for mobile users and for different apps. So it's mm -hmm. really a lot of work for customized uh, for different platforms. Yes. When you also mm -hmm. operate as a consultant uh, mm -hmm. for companies, what do Western companies get right and what do they get wrong in China, talking about luxury and social media? I think uh, you probably heard about the news, right, uh, of certain brands that went wrong, like Deutsche & Gabbana, maybe you heard yeah. about that. I don't want to talk too much about it, but I think the respect of a culture is very important. And certain brands, even Burberry, if you take a look at the campaign of Burberry, this season it's shot by a very famous photographer. But in China, it's a little bit criticized because uh, uh, now everybody, the whole industry is going very Chinese. Like certain times, I give some brands, for example, like you know there's a year of the pig. You know, like sometimes it's the year of the monkey. And some watch brands, they uh, probably put the image of a pig on the watch. And then because sometimes the designer or I think the team that does art direction doesn't really understand the culture of China. They're not like Chinese. Uh, but I give you a very successful example of Balenciaga. You know, Balenciaga actually sent its, chi its team, and Gucci too, I was heard. They sent their team to the street of China. And it's not only one, one tier, first tier city. They sent to second, third tier city to do street scouting or to in experience the local life, to talk to, to ha they have their liaisons in second, third tier city uh, for certain content to, they do research, you know, so actually when you release the content or you release the product, the reaction is something you can expect. So the focus group is very important, I think. Uh, sometimes, you know, some luxury brands, they, they feel like they should do something, to, so they do it from top down, you know? Uh, they don't do it from um, bottom up. But social media, I think it's something that's, it goes two ways. Uh, we did not expect, you know, like the Deutsche Gabbana, you know, the show was canceled just because the creative director said something inappropriate, uh, and it was canceled almost four or six hours before the, sh the commencement yeah. of the show. If social media didn't go that big, you know, usually it would not, you know, be like that. Maybe they still have the event, but now social media can make or break a brand. So I think, um, you know, for certain luxury, uh, luxury brands, the study listening to, to your genuine consumers is very important. If you don't have that big crowd, you can, I think my suggestion is to have the China team to do more research and investigation and to listen to the heart of ending consumers. They're, they do really matter. For example, like yesterday, we took some pictures of celebrities and maybe because there are too many photographers on site, too many media press, so um, maybe sometimes the celebrity could look a little short. If you shoot them like this, you know, they could look a little short, but if you shoot them like that, they could look really tall. Uh, but the fans of celebrities that really want their idol to look amazing on picture. So when we <laughs> post these pictures, we saw people's comments, oh, he should look taller. So sometimes we make adjustments, you know, really on site. You have to be really social media, uh, uh, you know, active uh, by the real time. I mean, that's very critical. Like in yeah. China, sorry, uh, allow me to talk a little bit longer, maybe. <laughs> uh, no, no, definitely. Cloud Photography is essential. Like here, I think it's a cultural difference. Like I was in the UK, we were covering like cans too. Like sometimes photographers, they take weekend breaks. Like for example, they work, they shoot here, and then they don't retouch the photo on site. They go back home, they take a weekend break, and Monday they retouch picture, they publish on newspaper. That's the traditional way of journalism or media, right? Uh, but, but I do production, I start from blogging, content generation to the you know, the end. I know how it goes. If you don't publish these uh, key content on site, other fans or followers, they will just, or, you know, regular media, you know, just strangers on, on site, they will use their cell phone to take picture of these celebrities or these key events. And then you will see these bad photos everywhere before you publish uh, your retouched photo. So now the technique in China, basically for all major events, if you don't do it, I really recommend you to do, is like in China, you have a major event, you always do on-site retouching, on-site photo approval, on-site publishing, even the video, it has to be. So my team is like, we're working basically 200 days, 300 days, um, till like 
2 p.m. or uh, 2 a.m. in the morning. I guess it's like event finish it at, at about 10, sometimes 11 or 9 if earlier, and then we have to work all the content. Uh, all the way through. So speed yeah. is more important than the actual final beauty of the picture. But anymore. I think the beauty is also important. Yeah. So we do the retouch too. Because social media, some people just do the, it's called UGC, user generated content. It's like when, for example, Hugh Jackman is here. You use your phone, you take a picture of Hugh Jackman on your phone and, and you, you publish. It, yeah. That's, you know, not refined. But I mean, now the technology is very mature. Like in China, the photographer, they hang have the, the device. Uh, connected to cl to the cloud. So if I take a picture of you or Hugh Jackman, it will be automatically sent to the cloud and someone from the back office can work on the photo retouching and editing and curation. So the content after the event by the night could be really professional. Like the one I sent to you, I think it's okay. It's not no. excellent, amazing like cinema, but it's better than cell phone cunt materials. Okay. But it's, it's, it's very important. Yeah. Yes. I want to pick up on a couple of things that you said. Thanks. First one is this last one about the speed. Mm -hmm. uh, the traditional way of working, particularly in luxury companies, is that every word and every statement needs to be checked and approved by headquarters. That takes time. Yes. Right? You're basically saying, if you continue that way, you're going to lose an audience because the audience wants fast things. It wants things now. When things are happening, you need to hit the momentum. Am I interpreting correctly what you're saying? I think there are a couple of approaches to solve the problem. One is to have a couple of guidelines, like certain things. For example, SIHH 2019 is a hashtag. We can communicate beforehand to make sure certain messages are delivered. And now, uh, uh, according to my knowledge, press release is already written and confirmed before no. the commencement of a certain event or a certain uh, campaign. So we can prepare key messages beforehand and we can publish both uh, semi or professional generated content and also official content. So I mean like for, that, that's why brands now don't just work from the official channel. They have people like us, they have people from the media. And I think it's just the PR team or the marketing and communication team that needs to work on different levels of content. For example, the official of certain brands, you can still do the approval, you can still do the refine and the back translation and everything really precisely. The traditional way, the official way, I think it's very important. It's top down, it's, it's important. Mm -hmm. But then there are like certain audience or magazines or you know digital platforms or bloggers influencers like us we can certainly have a certain level of freedom or um you know uh freedom of speech or you know freedom of content but but probably some certain brands that will give us a talking point or the direction or certain <laughs> sorry bless you it's okay uh certain guidelines so you are not gonna go you know totally off mm -hmm. but sometimes yes uh you could, certain, uh, you know, for example, some certain words yeah. are not correct. And then now, thanks to the renovation of social media in China, basically all these contents now could be modified. So if you post and then you are really into the feedback of netizens and then you are really connected, uh, which means you cannot really sleep after you have done <laughs> an event. You have to be like 24 hours online, they're exactly. monitoring. And then um, I think certain problems could be controlled. The beast needs to be fed 24 hours a day. Yes. I want also to go back to the point you made about Dolce & Gabbana and uh -huh. the sensitivity. Yes. Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I have the mm -hmm. impression that uh, uh, there is a, a stronger cultural pride in China today than ever, maybe just a few years ago. That some True. messages that a few years ago would have just gone through, now they get that kind of reaction and pushback from social media. And yes. So companies need to be very aware of that. It's something new in a way. I agree, I agree. I think it's very important still to have like a small control group. It could be your colleagues or your uh, company members, but there definitely need to be a Chinese background. And I think now it's very important when it comes to economy, to culture, to politics, to be safe, play safe. Because, uh, you know, sometimes uh, risk, even for example, I give you an example of uh, Ulysse Nachton. Uh, everybody's talking about this uh, fairy tale, but they, they express it in a very central way, you know? Like, in general, they say it's they have a lesbian watch, you know? Like, <laughs> that kind of content online, it's good. You know, it's, it's, it has a talking point. Social media is very viral, but uh, at the same time, it could be censored. Like, in China, this problem uh, happens with Durex, because they always play that, 
you know, that ambiguity. Yeah. But sometimes that could be censored. The, 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 or that could be like, uh, for example, I post some pictures of models on the runway, and then even now in China, uh, you cannot do nudity. Like certain times, designers they could have like some uh, semi-nude or you know something that's over sexy, and then the government really takes it down. So I think th that's that's really important to play by the rules, to know the laws and regulations. And uh, if you have like internal, like just just some uh, focus groups, small ones, you you ask people around. It's uh, like to be on WeChat and ask around. It it, it always works. I think respect the feedback of your Chinese uh, colleagues and their you know um, insight yeah. of uh, these gray areas and. Uh, I think to have official channel very clean, very formal, and unofficial channel, for example, like a watch editor. Like last year, I think SIHH for Ulis Nachton, they have the other more controversial watch, you yep. know, the love making one. Yep. The editors, they push it, it's okay. You know, they talk in their private moment, they talk it not on the newspaper, the printed, because printed government really. They censor it, you know. Even like the video that I posted just now, you saw the vertical one. Um, we have to go through like a government a censorship. They will go through, and if the celebrity they wear too little, we probably cannot publish. Or it's, you know, sometimes for example in China you cannot talk about like we, we do absolute vodka, but we can never shoot people drinking. You know that kind of image, it, because it, the country is really big. Young people, if they're very active on our pl platform, they see young people drinking. It's a little. You know, negative. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's it's getting tighter. I mean, in general, the atmosphere somehow. Okay. Yes. Uh, I want to show mm -hmm. some more pictures of you navigating <laughs> different events, but uh, there's not one I want to talk about. I want to pick up on your point about China is big and very diverse because, uh -huh. uh, of course, that means that there are subcultures, there are you know yeah. different things happening in different cities. Yes. You spoke before about tier one, two, three cities, etc. Uh, which city do you think is setting cultural trends in terms of fashion and luxury today in China? Is it I Shanghai, mean, uh, Chengdu, whatever? Beijing is more cultural if I've been to Beijing. Uh, Shanghai is more like business, it's the HQ of a lot of uh, luxury brands. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I think it's time to explore Xi'an and Chengdu. Uh, the picture on the, on the right side, top right side, actually, it's the international star look of the year event. Um, it's a global, I think Elite used to do this event, so it's a global model contest, and now it's held in Xi'an. And President Xi, the president of China, actually his hometown is Xi'an, and Xi'an is holding a fashion week now. So I think certain uh, cities like Xi'an and Chengdu are trending. For example, Dior, they did a mega big event in Chengdu, uh, like two, two months ago. And Chanel, last year, they did a fashion show uh, in, uh, I think in Chengdu. And people in those areas like Chongqing and Chengdu, they're not, you know, that exposed or overexposed to fashion and luxurious brands uh, like people in Shanghai and Beijing. Shanghai and Beijing, I think, is really getting, you know, the, you see the bubble if you go there. The real estate and the mall sometimes are basically empty. You know, people are so digitally uh, active. They, they go on far fetch. You know, all, everybody around me, everybody I basically buy far fetch from uh, head to toe. I mean, especially tier one city, a lot of young people, they just, because if you buy on far fetch, you can get it in China in three days to five days. Even with a custom clearance, I bought this in, on far fetch, this is on far fetch, <laughs> everything basically. So um, I think people in Chengdu and Chongqing, these second tier city, they're not that educated yet, and they're curious, and they're still very shopaholic. They need to go out and party and hang out with their friends and, uh, uh, I think uh, it was like, like studied consumer behavior wise pe because Chongqing and Chengdu, Sichuan, the whole province, if you study it, it's geographically, it's a basin. So people in Chongqing and Chen Chengdu, they don't really like fly around globe trot that heavily. They're very domesticated somehow. And uh, they play mahjong, they're very, they like tea, afternoon tea. The lifestyle in there is pretty chill. So mm -hmm. they like this, uh, luxurious lifestyle in there and all my clients their feedback's been extremely good for second tier city if you do a promotion there vip crm in there it's it's more you know right on it, it's it's visible the the feedback of the consumers are more active than you know just uh, uh the you know if you do one in beijing and shanghai because it's mm -hmm. oversaturated yeah. yes now you're a communicator you mm -hmm inform your followers and fans and, and readers. How do you inform yourself? Where do you go to find your information? Uh, 
I'm, I'm still very into the industrial magazines and applications. I, I subscribe to Vogue Italia uh, and Bazaar UK. I read Monocle magazine. I, uh, uh, I'm always uh, reading WWD, which is Women's Wear Daily for fashion uh, insiders, industrial readers. And I read uh, Vogue Runway, Now Fashion, all these platforms. Uh, and in China, of course, we have our own platforms. Like GQ in China is still very premium, very, uh, you know, dedicated to menswear readers and also watch lovers. GQ is really nice. And in China, we have, uh, I, I think I'm still reading certain, like Vogue, mm -hmm. uh, they're still professional. I mean, they do digital now. In China, all the traditional magazines now have their digital department. And then they're really professional. Like El Man, I know I saw the med editors in here. He didn't go to Menswear Fashion Week, I guess. He come over here, so okay. you see the influence which, of... Which says, which says something. Yeah. Let's see if someone here in the studio has any yeah. question for Peter. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, let's just wait for the microphone. It's coming to your left. Yes. Yes. Sorry about that. Sorry. At the microphone checked, a new one is coming. Yes. Let's see if this one, yes. Okay, hello. Hi. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, just one question. What was the exact point why Dolce & Gabbana was fallen in, in disgrace on the Chinese market? Okay, uh, to make it short, if you saw the video online, it's a Chinese model eating a spaghetti with chopsticks, you know? And like the Chinese, they say in the opening of the video is like, oh, we, uh, I will show you how to use the chopstick, this little thingy to eat our glorious spaghetti. So they say something, maybe to poke fun, because it's a little sexual, you know, the little thingy, the, you know, the, the in indication. And then uh, the way of behaving, of using, because with Chinese people, the younger generation, you know, they grew up in this Western culture. Everybody knows how to use knife and fork. So nobody really does that. I think they did it imaginatively, and designer, they are really creative, so they don't really do engagement. They don't really listen to other people's suggestions. They just made the video. And then um, uh, a couple of videos like that. Now if you see Dolce & Gabbana's latest campaign, it's the Italian supermodels, uh, not just Italian. I think it's all supermodels dressed in fancy outfit on the beach in a, uh, I think it's in some certain, maybe Cinque Terre or some beach, and then there are like ordinary people, some fat people in the picture. So it could be like a, you know, misleading, like, oh, we are more superior than you guys. You guys are inferior. So it's kind of a, you know, a little discriminating, I think. And this didn't really cause a big discussion or big, you know, people's hate or dislike of the brand. The, the major thing is like online, on Instagram, if you see, if you Google, like Stefano Gabbana had an argument with a blogger, Diet Prada or some other bloggers, they have a conversation. And then I think he was under a lot of pressure because I know Apex, the production team of the whole show, they're gonna do a greatest show ever. They have more than 300 models and everybody's working on the job. I guess Stefa, Stefano was stressed at that time because he need to work on the dress, work on everything. Uh, it's, it's way too much. And then uh, when the blogger questioned about the, the etiquette and if it, this is inappropriate or not, Stefano sweared. Like he said something bad about Chinese people being critical and being like Chinese culture is like shit. He said something inappropriate. And all my foreign friends didn't know this. They just know about the video. They didn't see the screenshot, but it was really big online. Everybody saw that. And then uh, Deutsche Gabbana claimed like it was uh, not really, it, the, 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 the accounts account were was hacked. hacked. Yeah. But you know, people are like Chinese people, they're not stupid. They say, how could like two accounts being hacked at the same time? Because there is a screenshot of the designer using Deutsche Gabbana's official account to say something bad. And also at the same time, uh, his own account. And it's the same way, tone of manner, same way of talking. We can, because I know Stefano himself. And for these designers, they're creative people. So it, they didn't mean really something so harmful or discriminating, but eventually what they said really offended the you know, Chinese crowd. And then when they reacted in the beginning, they didn't say something from the bottom of their heart. They didn't. You know, they say, okay, it was hacked. And then they say, I'm sorry, the show will be postponed. But actually the show was canceled. So it's like every time when they 
um, you know, it, it, it like snowball. Every time when they apologize, even like Chinese said, uh, you know, because the population is big. So when they uh, studied, when they really released the apology video, if you watch it, they, they think the designer are not sincere in terms of their body language. So these, all, you know, online citizens, they are really articulate, they observe. So if they're not sincere, they disrespect, they cause the problem. And even Lucky Blue Smith, he's American. He saw this whole thing, he was in China. He said no to attend the, the show. I feel bad because I have so many friends working for the brand and I respect the brand in general. But this is, I think, something we can all study and learn from. So I think social media sometimes is not just positive. It could be negative too. We have to, everybody, prepare. What if something happens? How could you tackle the problem really quickly? Yeah, there was yes. another question Thank just you. here, the gentleman, yes. Thanks. Hello, my name is Daniel Hook from Swiss Press NZZ am Sonntag. Hi. I, um, I wonder, how do you finance yourself? Where does your revenue come from? Or That's how do you question. charge the brands you work together? That's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, in the beginning, initially, it was purely ideal. Like I go to Paris, I attend Dior show, Chanel show, they don't really pay me. Even celebrity, you know, they, they cover hotel and accommodation. So at that time, actually, I financed myself more from digital cases of FMCG brands, like Unilever, like uh, Olay, like L'Oreal, they do beauty, because beauty is closely related to fashion. And you know L'Oreal is actually the sponsor of Paris Fashion Week and Maybelline is the sponsor of New York Fashion Week. So at that time, I have to do both. And it's relevant, but it's extra work. And um, sometimes it's because I do uh, consulting work with brands. I, I go to these events, I know these designer, I know these uh, celebrities. So I connect certain brands with certain um, celebrities and the uh, resource. So I call myself a digital pimp. It's a joke, but it's, it's true. At that time, I have to, for example, I go to Paris Fashion Week, I know which celebrities are coming, uh, if they're available for street style or for some uh, other projects. I try to get these projects done, so I take my agency or commission uh, from the brands. Yes, so mostly from the brands, but of other fields in the very beginning. And then I figure out like fashion brands and watch brands, they also need visual, they need production, because I've been in Paris for five years, I go to all the fashion shows. I don't think there is a second guy like me, because, you know, I go to fashion weeks, sometimes not. Uh, I, I don't take the front row seat. Sometimes brands want me to sit in front row. But when you see me, I'm always covered by a camera <laughs> because I'm taking all the pictures by myself. Uh, and why I do it is because of the need of social media. Because if I ask a photographer to take picture for me, number one, he doesn't know the product. Like for example here, I think some of you editors, senior editors in watchmaking, you know if you hire a photographer, he doesn't know what you need. And it, you know, for fashion weeks or fashion shows, it's really happening fast. If you don't take the shot of the back, the model appears in front of you for only two seconds, and then the model is gone. You cannot get a clear shot of the product, and you cannot really get the right message delivered on time. So I started to do photography. And then really professionally, I work with people in Paris. I, w I work with my team uh, in New York. So we uh, start to expand the team and do more content. So sometimes now, I hate myself in the picture, actually. Uh, but for brands, we also need to represent the brands. Uh, I prefer doing fashion weeks or you know, like events, photos, like my China team does uh, official images for Ulysse Nachton uh, or video. And then uh, we uh, showcase the product. We tell the stories, but we also wear it. We get the right models, right celebrities uh, to deliver the right brand message. So it's a whole bunch of work, starting from me, myself, and now to uh, content. And then just now we talk about a little bit of channels. So basically we uh, focus on the, the whole supply chain. Thank you. That's how I get my service and production fee from the brands. Any one last question? Yeah. Thanks very much. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you one, which is, what's the next thing you're going to put out on your networks from SIHH? Uh, I probably will like spend tomorrow a whole day editing the video. Okay. So we're going to release it also on my Instagram. What SIHS is all about, all the shocking, shock value visually. That's okay. the impression of the whole thing towards the younger generation. And then we'll do a thorough article of all the brands we've been to. And some of the brands, they have different talking points. 
uh, that really impressed me. So we talk about the key products and the key, uh, the highlights. Okay. Uh, and then we have to release a long video, uh, maybe one or two minutes of Geneva, of our impression of the city, more travel vlog style. But uh, I'm gonna, I I'm sure it's gonna be stunning. Yeah. Okay, so I guess we're gonna, we're gonna yeah. end here. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you, Peter, for giving us some of your time. Thanks. And for sharing your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much. Thank you. See you maybe next year. Thanks. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. And the next session is going to be at 2.30 p.m. Geneva time. We're going to talk about a completely different topic, which is how to preserve and transmit traditional watchmaking skills. 2.30 p.m. Geneva time here at SIHH Live. Goodbye.